Welcome to Count Me In. Today we have a special guest, Joe Keeley, CEO of Justify, joining us to discuss the world of fintech and its impact on business. We'll explore what fintech really means, how companies can harness its potential, and why it's important for businesses to understand the various tools available in the fintech toolbox. Joe will also share some fascinating success stories and insights on how companies can thrive in this financial technology-driven world. So let's get started and delve into this exciting world of fintech. So Joe, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. We're really excited to have you on and we're going to be covering the topic of fintech. And that is a big buzzword in the industry right now. And I was hoping that we can maybe start with defining where you fit in the fintech world and we'll continue on from there. Well, that's great. Thanks for having me, Adam. And it is, I think fintech is sort of one of the biggest buzzwords that's out there. It's been said by, you know, a leading a venture capital firm that, you know, every company should be or will be a fintech company so it's like okay well you know that's a lot of pressure so first of all i think we need to step back and say like what is that mean i mean and it's just an abbreviation you know just sort of flat-footed first it's financial technology which can mean so many different things but i think uh, for us so the company that i i lead is called justify and we exist to do just that to accelerate the potential or the fintech potential of other software platforms. So in that context, it turns out that a lot of companies that are out there, one of their major or their their biggest or only economic engine is not actually selling the product or the service or the access then that is sort of there in plain sight. So for example, software platforms there's many, many software platforms that they sell a SaaS fee and they charge you to use it. But that is simply the Trojan horse to get funds flow. So they're making money on payments. They're making money by offering additional fintech products like embedded insurance, embedded lending, card issuing. So when you think about interchange, that sort of deliberately opaque you know, monster that no one really seems to understand. You can make money and participate on interchange by chart, you know, on by lowering your costs and keeping your price. And you can make money on interchange by participating at being high too, by issuing cards. So there's just a lot in there, but ultimately what we do as a company is help platforms with their economic engine being FinTech and we provide infrastructure and a team to help them do that. But I think it's interesting for all companies, not just software companies, to think about and try to understand what are the different tools in the fintech toolbox and how could they be applicable to your business, big or small, whether that be through cost reduction or an area that's typically not talked about by you know finance and accounting professionals is you know enhancing the revenue. Totally. And and I think the other part of the problem that we run into with every company being a fintech company is that you and I were touching on this a little bit before we started recording where, you know, where does it live? You know, your IT team has to manage it and finance has to touch it, but nobody really owns it. And how can you really fully manage it if no one really owns the software when it's when it's within your company? Yeah, and I think that is a, a really big issue. And, you know, we part of our our justify we have what we call you know we have our tech infrastructure but we also have an engaged fintech team where we have a dedicated chief payments officer a chief fintech officer that's available to our clients because they sit in between finance and accounting and you know product and engineering or it at a particular company but i would think you know one of the the things that i would really encourage and you know if nobody owns if if multiple people own something to your point adam then nobody owns it but to finance and accounting professionals to really take the ownership of you know how can we and challenging the status quo does this 3% need to be 3% when we collect our how could we think about differently on lowering cost how could we think differently on what adjacent revenue streams could be available to us where you're enhancing the offerings to your customers. It may not be the core product, but ultimately it's been said that on every dollar in commerce, there's up to 10% of that. So a thousand basis points that is available and sort of leaks out 
whether that's in fees in, fees out, early pay discounts, all of these different things. So I would encourage, you know, from a strategic perspective, it's one that finance and accounting can own this. Mm -hmm. Implementation of how it's working is more product and engineering. Of course. You know, an example that comes to mind is I just saw a, an article, I think a couple of days ago, where Amazon's going to start accepting Venmo as a payment option. And if the big bowling with Amazon can start accepting Amazon as a digital payment or it can start accepting Venmo as a payment, you know, what possibilities are there for every company to accept different types of payments and be more creative using technology? That's right. And, and sometimes you're accepting a type of payment like Venmo or a buy now, pay later. And it's actually a more expensive payment method. Mm. Those are more expensive payment methods than credit card and debit card and then bank transfers and ACH going all the way down. Mm -hmm. And you do that because you're trying to get more customers or a bigger, you know, you're trying to ease the customer journey, the customer experience. But in terms of every company being a fintech company, I think you want to make those choices with your eyes wide open because, you know, what if you could monetize or make money on that payment flow, mm. you know, and, and it takes certain kinds of architecture to do that. But just understanding the space, I think, is is the first step. You know, why are we doing something? What is it actually going to cost? And um, it uh, there's just an immense amount of of opportunity that exists there. But basis points can matter at scale. They very mm -hmm. much matter at scale. Yeah, especially when it's affecting your bottom line in the in the long run, especially when there's a tight market and inflation and everything else happening. That's right. That's right. So as we think about companies trying to be more advanced and trying to be a fintech company and trying to be creative, do you have any examples of companies that have been successful or, you know, it doesn't have to be specifics, but are there any things of, of successful ways of becoming a fintech company if you're just a regular? Maybe we could talk about some success stories that you've seen. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we have a, a number of them and we help a number of software platforms harness the power of, of fintech. And in that instance, there's really, it's a little more straightforward because in software platforms, they have business customers. The platform has a business customer, and then the business customer has a customer themselves. And when you have three legs of the scoot stool, there's then opportunity to, you know, do the probably one of the more, you know, best known fintech, you know, monetization, which is payment arbitrage, where you're charging 3%, you know, to for at a platform level to the customers, but your cost is actually 1.9%. Mm -hmm. And then you take that delta and you multiply it times funds flow. So then that number can sometimes get much, much bigger than the actual SaaS fee that someone might be charging. Mm -hmm. So examples of that are Toast is one that many of us interact with on a weekly basis, whether we know it or not. So Toast is a recent is a vertical SaaS platform for the restaurant industry. They provide hardware, they provide software for restaurants. So if you go and, and order out for takeout or delivery, or you go into a restaurant and you swipe at their terminal, you'll see the little Toast logo. Well, Toast is just a fintech company, really. Mm. They provide software and hardware, but they're monetizing all the funds flow from all these restaurants. And then once you understand the funds flow, then you can start offering those restaurants short-term loans, maybe to repair an oven. And why would you do that from a customer standpoint is because if you are embedded in their software, that is a much better user experience than that restaurant owner deciding, I want to go walk down and talk to my local banker. And by the time I fill out that application, you know, and do the KYC and all the things that need to be done, I've already put the new oven on my credit card because it's an emergency, more or less, you know, short-term capital needs. So there's all of these, Toast really started as a fintech company first. That was their intent all along. But if you look at a direct-to-consumer company, you know, this example that's been fairly, you know, widely uh, used is, you know, one we all or many of us interact with on sometimes our daily ritual, and that's Starbucks. Mm. So you think about Starbucks, Starbucks launches their app. And if you notice, you know, when you when you are topping up your balance, the default is $20. 
Now you can go in and change it, mm. but when you add $20 to their card, their app, now their average transaction size is much bigger than a $4 cup of coffee. So their effective rate on credit card processing goes down and they clearly have a ability to negotiate beyond let's say all of us at this point. Yeah. But also Starbucks is now a bank. Mm. They're holding billions and billions and billions of dollars on stored value cards mm. in which they can use as working capital for no interest while we wait captive to order the next macchiato. So I think just really stopping and thinking about how is money flowing in to your organization? How is money flowing within an organization? Maybe that applies, maybe it doesn't, depending on the size. And then how is money flowing out of the organization? So that's the first thing to think about as, okay, us as a fintech company. And are there opportunities to capture a couple of basis points? And you might say, you know, oh, a couple of basis points, I don't have the time. And maybe you don't, and maybe it doesn't apply. But for us, we work with vertical software platforms. And a lot of times it's not uncommon that they can get to many, many hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of money flowing in and around their ecosystem. So thinking about how, you know, and capturing 20 basis points on a couple billion all of a sudden is material. The other thing that folks should think about is where you know, if they think about themselves as a platform, whether they're literally a software platform like we work with at Justify, or, you know, maybe they're a marketplace or maybe they're, you know, what other, where, how many dollars are flowing, not maybe through your PL, but in and around your ecosystem? And could you bring those dollars in, in any way, shape or form? Could you offer that? Mm -hmm. So that's really what software platforms are doing where, you know, on the Toast example, they're providing lending, probably, you know, they, either off their own balance sheet or a credit facility or probably initially through partners. Mm -hmm. And they're participating in that transaction. But what they did is they took our restaurants are ne having short term capital needs and it's not happening within our software. Wouldn't it be great if we brought that in and then we're going to participate in that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is the sort of thing that we do with our clients. We help them build what we call a strategic fintech map, which is where are all the opportunities? And then you stack mm -hmm. rank and you go on that journey. But, you know, finance, thinking about, you know, dollars in, dollars within and dollars out in, in, in the whole ecosystem. And is there a way that we could reduce cost mm -hmm. or oftentimes even more exciting is impact revenue by harnessing some of these fintech tools. And it doesn't mean, in fact, you should not go out and think, okay, we have to go build a bunch of infrastructure. You know, we have uh, sub-account architecture and, and the software that we provide for, for platforms. I mean, sort of gone are the days if you're product and engineering or IT team says, well, geez, we're going to have to build all this stuff. You know, that makes about as much sense as saying you need to have a server farm now instead of using AWS or something. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it even, as you were talking, it made me think about the small to medium sized businesses. Like not everybody's a Starbucks and can handle that kind of a thing, but the way the technology is going, it's like any small and medium sized business can access this technology, whether it's you know, working directly with you or to working with like a, a organization like Toast where they can get access to these payment methods to make these things more accessible to their customers and make, give the ability to have those types of payments and ability to ha have this type of technology, even if they don't have a big IT team or finance team. Yeah. And I think the, if one's able to, if their business allows it, if you're able to monetize and, you know, that's, the power and harness the power of some of these different fintech tools, the value creation that it can have in your company in terms of valuation and how investors or acquirers look at the company can have an impact of 10x, literally 10x. So yeah. when we work with software platforms that maybe make 65 or or $100 a month in SaaS fees to their customers to use it. So you know, maybe it's a barbershop, you know, platform software that helps barbershops run. If they charge a barbershop $100 a month, you know, they'll get good SaaS multiples on that revenue 
for the valuation. Mm -hmm. But if all of a sudden now they have, well, we make the money on payments and we sell insurance to the barbershops and we provide capital to the barbershops and we do, you know, spend management. Now, all of a sudden you're in a completely different valuation category. Mm -hmm. So what effect does that have on the business? Is it, does it give them exponential ability to grow from that point on? Oh, the, the, it increases the lifetime value of the customer, mm -hmm. probably 5X. That's huge. Because if you think about it, if someone is charging $100 a month, okay, so we have a $1,200 customer there yeah. for the software. But now if they process, let's say, you know, a couple million dollars a year, and you're making 70 to 100 basis points off of that, mm -hmm. okay, and now you're getting 20 basis points off of a lending product, or, you know, if you're getting ultimately 200 basis points, you know, on as you go on your fintech journey of monetization by bringing partners in and doing different things, mm -hmm. now, you know, if that's, you know, you could add, you, you could double or triple or quadruple that $1,200. So now that that customer lifetime value is, you know, two to five X bigger than it was just selling software fees. And not only that, they're, we, we know from our experience that they're remarkably more sticky, meaning the churn that you experience mm -hmm. is lower. And oftentimes what software platforms that we work with at Justify, they have negative churn meaning their existing customers are growing beyond that because their payment volume is growing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, based on our conversation, it completely makes sense if you're not already doing something and probably pretty much everybody is, but let's say somebody's just getting into this space and trying to integrate like fin different fintech into their business. Are there any red flags that they should be on the lookout for since this is an ever growing, ever changing thing with companies popping up all the time? Yeah, I mean, I think that a couple of things that I would have folks think about, you know, is if you are bringing folks, partners into your ecosystem, you should be participating in the monetization, mm -hmm. number one. If you are finding yourself, you know, talking about or actually building core infrastructure, you should stop and ask, is this something that we need to build, right? And three... In order to participate in this, it used to be that you had to go through just immense pain and exposure of, to liability to be like a payment facilitator or to lend off your own balance sheet. You no longer need to do that. You should not do that. So don't take on the burden of you know being in the payments business, being in the lending business. There are businesses that are doing that, but you can partner with them and participate in it. And, you know, you're a better together scenario because the cost to build, maintain, you know, to be in this business, of course, with financial regulations, et cetera, mm -hmm. is ever increasing. So, you know, I, I'm not saying that everyone should go out and say, you know, now we are a fintech company, you know, Justify is a fintech company. We help others harness the power of fintech within their platforms. That doesn't necessarily make them a fintech company. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a slight nuance there. I think instead of the the way the quote was from, you know, I think it was Andreessen VC firm, um, where every company is a fintech company. It's like, well, I think I would modify that ever so slightly that every company could or should harness the power mm -hmm. of fintech and fintech tools within their company. And that makes a lot of sense because I was right before you said that I was going to ask you that question. So how can every time you be a fintech company in that case? But I, I think you answered that where, you know, everybody can harness has the potential to harness that power. And when you do harness that power, you've already just you've already given examples of how they can grow exponentially from that. So as we look at the future, you know, markets are all over the place. You know, there's inflation in the U.S. and globally. What do you think the future of fintech is going to look like as things are changing as we go forward? Well, I think it is going to continue to accelerate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there's, you know, all kinds of buzz out there as it relates to, you know, the challenging of interchange, the crypto blockchain, et cetera. And all mm -hmm. of that will happen, you know, but that's really the leading, bleeding edge right now. I think that they'll continue to be alternative payment methods. 
There is a great addiction to our credit card points in the U.S., so I don't see that going away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Even if it's like, even if it reduces, you know, 10%, which would be a massive number, it's still just a massive space. Mm -hmm. So I think that companies are going to need to really think about and meet customers where they are. How do they want to pay? When do they want to pay? You know, and with what method? And I think just challenging the status quo, the way that things have always been, is as as having that fintech mindset Mm -hmm. is what I would encourage folks to think about. You know, look through that lens and say, does this need to cost what it has always cost, and why? Is there a revenue stream that we can participate in? And sometimes the answer might be no, Mm -hmm. depending on the business, but. It's amazing that uh, the power and the value that can be increased with just a a different point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes the economic engine that exists or could exist inside of a business is not what the business is actually in. Mm -hmm. Because when you think about the, the size of all fintech, right, which includes payments, which is one of the largest industries in the entire world, right? And insurance and lending. I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing how big it is. It is pretty amazing. And, you know, as I circle back to the finance and accounting team, just thinking about that team, the look of that team is constantly changing with the advances of technology. Do you think that like an accounts payable person, their set of skills is going to have to change? What is that set of skills going to look like in the future? Because in the past, it was just like receiving payments and sending them out. But that set of skills and that knowledge is going to have to change as the technology changes. Yeah. And I think there are some great technologies that are out there to help accounts payable be uh, more efficient. And a lot of times those tools will be available for low or no cost. And that might be great. And maybe that's just embracing new technology and new companies that are out there. But if you have the fintech mindset, mm-hmm. you're able to look at that and say, how come they're they're going to handle, they're, I'm going to use this platform and they're going to handle all my accounts payables and they don't, hard, how do they make money is the question one should ask. Well, they might be aggregating all these accounts payable, going to vendors and getting the early pay 5% discount. Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden that's 500 basis points that they've captured. And they may be paying those payables on a card, a virtual card, credit card that they spun up and are participating in a portion of the interchange for another 80 basis points. So having that mindset, because basis points matter, Mm. they matter at scale, they matter over years and years. So having that mindset around, you know, not and, and identifying certainly for some businesses, I mean, you know, it's very, very clear the playbook for vertical SaaS platforms and marketplaces. You know, that's who we work with to help them. It may not be as clear for, you know, the neighborhood coffee shop, let's say, <laughs> you, know, mm-hmm. you know, say, well, I'm not Starbucks and I'm not a vertical SaaS platform, but they do use a lot of software and platforms. So just having that mindset and looking at the world and understanding who is, how is the money flowing mm-hmm. and how, who's making money on this money flowing, I think is a great place to start. This has been Count Me In, IMA's podcast, providing you with the latest perspectives of thought leaders from the accounting and finance profession. If you like what you heard and you'd like to be counted in for more relevant accounting and finance education, visit IMA's website at www.imanet.org.